introduce our candidates. We're doing alphabetical today. So we have Senator Ben Allen here and Mr. Baron Bruno on the far side. So we're gonna start with opening statements and we're going to start, again, alphabetical this time. When we finish, Mr. Bruno, you will go first when we finish, okay, with this closing statement. Sure. Okay, Senator yeah. Allen. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here and for participating. And I just want to um, say thank you to, to Baron. I think this is our fourth and final uh, debate that we've had yeah. through the course of this year. And uh, and you know, I actually think we've developed a friendship of sorts, uh, which is not unusual for uh, for a situation like this. But Baron's a good guy, and uh, and I, you know, it takes a lot of guts to step up and run for office. And I know that myself. And. I just appreciate the civil discourse that we've had, and the, uh, you know the, the the really I think robust exchange of ideas, and uh, and so thank you to you, Baron. Thank you to the league for helping to allow us to have these robust uh, civil discussions about the issues of the day. I think it's so vitally important that we have a, an informed electorate, uh, certainly in these days more than ever before. Uh, so my name is Ben Allen. I've had the honor to, to represent this district for the last four years. Um, I'm just previously served on the, the school board in Santa Monica, Malibu. I, uh, I also uh, taught at UCLA Law School. And um, I've been working on a lot of different issues since I've been in the legislature. I'm chair of our environmental caucus. I'm passionate about doing what we can to protect our environment here in California. I'm, 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 I've played a role in the leadership role that, that California is playing globally on issues like climate change and clean energy and green energy and, and also protecting our coastline. I was involved with the efforts to try to make sure that we don't allow uh, offshore oil drilling. I was, I've, I've had several bills relating to water quality and, and, and water runoff and protecting fl uh, offshore flora and fauna. Um, uh, and also protecting our beaches from, from plastics pollution. Uh, I'm passionate about campaign finance reform and transparency issues. I'm passionate about public education. I'm the chair of the education committee. I'm the son of two educators, and I myself uh, have, have been a teacher, and, and uh, having served on the school board as well, I've been really working hard to try to figure out ways to get more money into the system and also help to, to, to address some of the, the constant simmering tensions that exist between various sides of the education debate. Uh, I'm also passionate about trying to do what we can to, to improve our transportation infrastructure, our transit system, and uh, our healthcare infrastructure as well. There are so many challenges in our state, and I'm proud of the leadership role that I've, I've been playing representing this area. Thank you. Thank you. Baron. Uh, thank you, uh, Mary Ellen and Nancy and uh, League of Women Voters. Uh, really nice to be here, and thank you all for taking the time here to, uh, to learn a little bit more about uh, Senator Allen and myself and why we're running. And again, it's been a pleasure uh, to reiterate uh, getting to know Ben and, and seeing uh, the exciting things that are going on in his family personally, and, and uh, <laughs> as well as all the exciting things that are going on here in California. So we do both share the passion for helping uh, others other than ourselves. And I commend uh, anybody um, who's in office or running for office, and I encourage every one of you that are sitting out there thinking probably at one point, man, I could do that too. Well, I encourage you to get up there and, and give it a shot as well. It's uh, running for office is, is uh, certainly not easy. It's uh, definitely time consuming, but it's, it's a very exciting adventure. So that being said, I'm Baron Bruno and I'm not a career politician. I run a real estate team and I have a background not only in real estate in both commercial and residential real estate, also uh, in financial services. Uh, I worked in Wall Street in New York City. Um, all of my coworkers at Canter Fitzgerald went down on 9-11, so I was very passionate about um, uh, you know, treating people with respect. Uh, and also, um, I've done a lot of training and development work and helping those who are less fortunate, and that has led me here, obviously, to helping the people of California in getting their voices heard, um, making their priorities and your priorities uh, most important and not special interests, big um, corporations and lobbyists. And I think that's something that I think you would all agree that would really benefit you and your families the most. Um, that being said, um, it's uh, it's an honor to be here. And if you want to learn more about me and the campaign, you can go to votebaron.com, V-O-T-E-B-A-R-O-N.com to learn more about how I'm best going to represent you in the Senate. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Baron, we'll start with you since we started with Ben on the other sure. one. Okay. How can the state reduce expenditures? Yeah, this is a this is a uh, a great one. And uh, first and foremost, I know that uh, Al and Frank had, had uh, discussed this as well earlier. Um, being financially responsible 
Um, I believe in financial responsibility for our governments uh, at all levels. We as people are financially responsible. We sit around the, the kitchen table and talk about how much money we have, how much money we can spend. We even teach that to our children. But yet our elected officials are highly irresponsible and are continually living in debt. And what happens is they say, well, we're running out of money, so where do we get it? We get it from all of you. And I don't appreciate that, actually. I think, why are we continuing to fund uh, financial irresponsibility? The first and foremost is this bullet train to nowhere. That has to be cut immediately. The, the, the $33 billion that was approved by the voters is now almost $100 billion. Now think about that. If you had your, your child or your business and you went over 200% over budget, there would be some hell to pay, I think, there. But right now, our 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 elected officials are not being held accountable. In my opinion, they should be federally prosecuted uh, for fraud by taking all of our money and not, there's no transparency. Where's the money going? But there's no, there's no results and I think that's abysmal. So we need to look at also the legislatures uh, are getting a 3% increase in their pay and, and government employees are getting a 10% raise, but yet we as taxpayers are giving them more and more money without that accountability. So we need to make tough decisions and uh, guaranteed pensions and benefits and things like that. We all need to make some sacrifices. Thank you. All right, Ben, same question. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. I mean, I think, you know, there are certain areas where we need to probably ex increase expenditures and other areas where we need to decrease expenditures. And, and I think that the, 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 the challenge is the, is the wisdom to know uh, which is which, and, and, and really to look at the things where we're spending way too much money. Uh, you know, you, you look at things like healthcare, for example, that continue to grow, the healthcare costs continue to grow about eight or nine percent, even though our, our inflation rates are around two or three percent. What's at the heart of that? Uh, if you look at the, at the extra surcharges that the oil industry has put on gas prices, if you look at the amount of money that we're spending on prisons, I heard in the last debate that we were having a conversation about prison reform. And you know, the truth of the matter is we're now spending about $60,000, $70,000 per prisoner. Uh, and we're actually now spending more money on the prison system than we are on public higher education. And so, you know, how I think a lot of it has to do with coming up with social policies that are smarter. I do think that, that it's also about accountability, making sure that everybody knows that uh, in, in the government that, that there are eyes on them. And it's partly why we need a robust press. It's why we need a strong audit function. I do give the governor a, a, a good deal of kudos for being pretty financially careful uh, in, for the most part. Uh, I think that he's been someone who has always been really, really cautious about trying to pass new expenditures uh, because he's so aware of the fact that we've got uh, long-term liabilities and that the economy continues in cycles. And it's part of why he also created the, the, the rainy day fund. Uh, and I think that's going to be a challenge for the next governor to make sure that we keep the expenditures in line. Uh, so I think it's about being wise, but I think it's also about being careful. It's about asking tough questions before we uh, approve new programs. Thank you. Okay, we'll start with Ben on this question. This is a little different. How can we increase the number of eligible voters who actually vote? Great question, great question. And I, I appreciate that question because uh, it's something that I've spent some time working on. I was chair of the Elections and Constitutional Amendments Committee and coming out of the 2014 election where we had abysmally uh, appalling uh, turnout rates, we looked at ways to try to increase voter turnout and voter engagement. And one of the key questions is how do we make it uh, easy for people who want to participate to participate. And this is going to be rolled out through my bill SB 450 that will co be coming out, not this election, but uh, in the future as the county gets online. But the idea is that everybody will be getting a ballot by mail, and then we will have vote centers that are open all over the county for 10 days before election day. So you can go in on a, on a weekend, you can go in anytime you want, but this whole model of the idea that you can only vote in one place at one time in one location between a certain set number of hours is, is an old model that doesn't fit with most people's lifestyles. Uh, it's also totally arcane and an anachronism. And so part of it has to do with making it easier. We're also going to make it easier for folks to register. Uh, now, actually, when people are eligible to, to register and they go to the, you know, to get their license or their ID, they will be automatically registered unless they opt out. We found that the biggest issue for young people was just simply the fact that they never gotten around to registering. Uh, that, you know, that was one of the biggest barriers to entry for young people being able to vote because a lot of them didn't have the wherewithal or hadn't figured out how to do it at some point over their first few years. 
uh, after they turned 18. So, and then I also think it's about making sure that elected officials and the candidates who are running for office show that what they're doing is relevant, that they care about their constituents, that they, they care enough to come out to things like this and engage with people, that they actually really are working really hard every single day to try to make things better for our society and our community. And I think people will respond to that as well. Thank you. Baron. Thank you. Uh, great question, and uh, I would love to see more elected officials and people like myself running for office um, going to the schools, actually, and getting younger people involved in the process early, because to Ben's point, a lot of younger folks uh, don't know how to register. Um, I canvass quite a bit and meet people all over the place in this uh, 26th Senate district. They don't even know how to register to vote. Um, so I think getting an educational awareness out there, and I think that would uh, certainly fall on the responsibility of the elected officials to get out there and say, hey, we need you, we need you to get you out there to vote. You can also look on uh, Ben's Facebook page. Um, I commend him for uh, reprimanding the DMV for getting people who shouldn't be voting. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So there, you know, it's another failure of, of big government, and uh, he acknowledged that. I appreciate that. But DMV is a great example of big government gone wrong, and um, they were getting people that shouldn't be voting that are voting, and so we're talking about doing the absolute reverse. Other things I would do is I would end the top two laws. Um, once elected in the Senate, that'll be the first bill I propose. We'll be ending top two laws in the uh, state of California because when you have two Democrats running against each other or two Republicans, um, you can see voter turnout has, has been abysmal. It's dropping precipitously each and every year. And the only thing that's bringing people the voting uh, boost are uh, the national elections. Also, I would make California a proportional state in their electoral college, no longer a winner-take-all state because everybody knows that by the time the uh, election comes to California, especially at the national level, um, California is assumed to be a democratic state, but if we make it uh, proportional, votes matter. And then um, also I would, again, uh, reiterate what Ben said about making uh, uh, voting easier uh, and online and more accessible to people. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, we're going to start with Baron on this question. Are you in favor of stricter gun controls? That's, uh, and I, I heard that yes uh, earlier, thank you. And I'm, uh, I'm a yes and no on that. Um, I believe in personal property rights. I believe that we do have the right to bear arms. However, I think that uh, we've taken that to the nth degree. I don't, I don't understand why certain people have bazookas and AK-47s and assault rifles in their homes. I think that responsibility goes back to the gun owner and that they need to understand that if somebody steals their guns, uh, or um, their their child or somebody takes the gun and does something illegal with that or, or happens to shoot or kill or somebody, that they need to be responsible. So that goes back to responsibility. And I and I and this goes also back to young people, I think, are one of the most discriminated classes in the United States because what happens is politicians take the easy way out and they just raise the law. They raise the law to say, okay, if you're an 18-year-old, let's just make it 21. And then they're going to make it 25 and 32, and it's just going to continue on. But if you're a responsible young person who's gone through gun safety courses, you shouldn't be discriminated against. It just, all this comes down to is month, number one is responsibility. Number two, we also equate mental health issues with, with gun violence as well. And those are two separate issues that I think oftentimes uh, cross over. So uh, at the end of the day, it's about responsibility. And you know, I appreciate politicians taking on the NRA, but I'd love if they took on some of these unions as well who are also significantly backed. So this is, again, um, I think a, an issue that um, all of you as voters need to ultimately decide what's best for you and your communities. Thank you. Thank you. Ben. Yeah, I do tend to support stricter gun laws. I, I, I you know, I, I, I'm just appalled by the extent to which we have just gone so inured to the gun violence that continues to impact our communities. I mean, it just seems like every week there's a new slaughter somewhere in the United States, and it, we're just all getting, in, you know, uh, inured to it. It's, it's extraordinary. If you actually go and look at, uh, and you actually look at what gun owners want, gun owners don't support folks running around with bump stocks and AR-15s and, and, you know, folks uh, who haven't had a background check, you know, folks who uh, walk around with semi-automatic weapons on the streets. Uh, you know, there are a lot of common sense reforms that the majority of gun owners support, but because of the way that special interest politics work and the way that the leadership of the NRA works and the way that that interplays with uh, the, you know, the, the, the base of, of certain areas of the, of the Republican Party, we haven't been able to make progress on this issue at the national level. I think in California, we've been making progress. A number of the shootings that have happened in other states recently would have been much harder to have happened here in California because we had phased out or, or put in place certain protections that 
that, that, that probably would have caught uh, a, a similar uh, offender uh, had they tried to do the same thing in the state of California. So I'm happy about that. We've also been putting some more restrictions on ammunition as well. Uh, so that ultimately this is really about you know, law-abiding, uh, you know, responsible folks being able to get access to their Second Amendment rights, but not other people who uh, intend to do harm to our society. Uh, so I think we need to continue to push in this direction and, and, and really challenge the leadership of the NRA that I think is not only out of step with the American people, but out of step with the average gun owner. Thank you. All right, we'll start with Ben on this next question. How can we stop the influence of big money in political campaigns and ultimately in government? This is a vitally important question, uh, and I actually think it really does. I mean, some of the problems that you heard about in the last debate and that we're talking about today actually do come down to the uh, the the, the pernicious in, uh, impact of special interests uh, in, over our political system. And it's one of the reasons why I've teamed up so passionately with Common Cause and the California Clean Money Campaign. Uh, the California Clean, Clean Money Campaign works on transparency laws, disclosure laws, clean money laws, campaign finance reform issues, including you know, the recent law that now makes it so that the top three donors to, to independent expenditures have to be very fully disclosed on TV ads and on mailers so that you will actually know who's paying for these things. Uh, you know, so the California Clean Money Campaign, the Common Cause have worked on these issues. California Clean Money Campaign literally ranked all 120 legislators, all 120 of us, based on your votes and, and leadership role uh, on various issues relating to clean money and, and disclosure and transparency. And I was number one in the entire legislature on this issue because I'm so passionate about this. I think that it ultimately comes down to the question of, of, of the, the vitality and vibrancy of our democracy. Will average folks, will, will normal citizens and taxpayers be able to have their voice heard or will it be drowned out by big money, uh, by dark money that seems to be dominating so much of our, uh, of, of our politics, not only here in California, but it's getting worse and worse in other states as well. So from my perspective, it's about doubling down on the work of the Clean Money Campaign, of Common Cause, the League of Women Voters has done a lot of really good work in this area as well, and just keep pushing that agenda until we can finally make some changes on the Supreme Court and overturn Citizens United. Thank you. Yeah. This is, thank you. This is, uh, thank you for the, whoever wrote the question. This is one of the biggest reasons I'm running for office, and I encourage every single person in this room, everyone that's listening or watching this, to run for office to break up the two-party system that has now destroyed the political environment in this country and is now making this one of the most divisive places and times in the history of this nation. I think you all agree. I see some of you nodding your heads how divisive this is in this country and especially in California. We need more than two choices. I'm running on transparency, respect, and choice, and this is a great example of big unions, big lobbyists, big special interests that are lying in the pockets of politicians and they, the same groups are funding the same groups on each side of the aisle and we, can, we have to stop shifting to the left and shifting to the right. We need to move forward together, and I'm a unifier. I'm, I, I'm not backed by huge political um, backers, big special interests. That's what we need. When we get big money out of politics, you all, we're all gonna breathe a, a fresh air and think so positively about one, in, one another because it's gonna be out lo about love and respect and actually getting things done. And it's about, you know, a public servant's job at all levels of government is to support the voters. And now Jerry Brown says you don't even need to live in your district to support the same people you're supposed to be representing. I mean, that's disgusting. The fact of the matter is here, if we don't get big money and special interests out of politics, it's gonna be the same old story over and over and over again. And if this is the way you guys wanna live here in this country and in the state, then that's, that's the way you can, you can vote. But I Thank encourage you, you to vote differently. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we're gonna start with you again, Baron. What do you think of County Measure W, and is it worth the cost to property owners? Um, I'm a little bit still on the fence on Prop W, and I think at this point right now, you know, I'm in, I'm in the real estate business, and you have to look at um, what's happening with uh, affordability in homes right now, and homelessness and things like that. And when we look at additional taxes, we look at additional burdens uh, that we're placing on homeowners and people at the county and the city and the state level, it's harder and harder for people to get by. And so we need to look at the financial impact of this and also how it affects people in their homes and how much money they have as disposable income. Um, 
if you look at what's happening in California, we have one of the, the worst housing climates in the United States right now. Um, a lot of people don't know that um, government in the state of California is mandating solar by 2020. Uh, this has not been in the press very much. It sounds great. This is another example of government coming in thinking they have a great answer for something, but then they're throwing a mandate out at people that you have to have solar. This is only going to increase the cost of housing for people that are already struggling to get housing. So all of these, yeah, again, a lot of people don't know these things are on the ballot because they're not, they're not out there. So this is why I always encourage you, don't just go to the voting box and vote D, 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 or R, 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 R. Really do yourself a favor and read each of these ballots and understand how it's gonna affect you financially and otherwise. Because again, when you see the word bond measure, that's a tax. Don't kid yourself, a bond measure is a tax. So if you think it's worth your while, whether it's Prop W or anything, then, then vote your conscience, but don't be influenced by big partisan people or something you read in the news. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so, so Measure W is a county measure uh, that has to do with clean water. And, and you, know, you, you heard during the last debate, uh, Frank Scotto talk pretty passionately about the infrastructural challenges that we have with regards to water and the extent to which water uh, is at the heart of California's ability to grow and thrive. Uh, you know, this has been a, a heart of this has been the part of California's story from the beginning. And if you know, if you want a good read about this, Cadillac Desert is an incredible book about this history. Uh, but certainly, the movie Chinatown gets into it too. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, here's the deal: uh, I have a whole bunch of cities, a lot bunch of cities that, that that either of us would represent if we're lucky enough to to win this election, uh, that are in a uh, really tight bind. A number of them are right here on the peninsula, right here on the hill. Uh, because they have very serious uh, rules relating to offshore, sorry, runoff and, and pollution that's associated with runoff. Uh, one of the cities in my district has a you know, $25 million annual budget and about a $200 million liability under the Clean Water Act, the federal Clean Water Act. This is not even something that the state has any control over because of the lack of good water infrastructure associated with runoff. And so what Measure W seeks to do is assist cities, like the four cities here on the Hill, with uh, their water infrastructure and make sure that they have the resources they need to clean up the system, clean up the aquifers, you know, make sure that, that all of us are gonna be able to have clean water coming into our faucets and, and taps and, 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 and showers. And that we'll also be able to make sure that we've got the resources that they need to clean up the pollution that is associated with water runoff so that we can meet our clean water uh, requirements under federal law. And that's what Measure W would do. That's why I'm supporting Measure W. Thank you. All right, Ben, we'll start with you. It's kind of a long question here. Um, when issues extend past city borders, we have only our county supervisor, our assembly member, and our state senator as elected representatives to appeal to. Will you pledge to take a stand on issues, for instance, like um, MHF use at refineries, proposed desal plants in El Segundo, or the development of our regional harbor in Redondo? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for that question. So um, yes, I mean, we because of this strange jurisdictional role that we play, we, we end up getting involved with these kinds of discussions all the time. I mean, there, there was an issue over the road diet along uh, Vista Del Mar up in uh, the northern uh, portion of the South Bay, you know, El Segundo, Westchester, Manhattan Beach area, and we had to get involved because there were different jurisdictional lines involved. Uh, so, so this is part of our role. Our office works on these kinds of things all the time. And on the issue of MHF, which is modified hydrofluoric acid. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dangerous acid that's used as part of the oil refining process, and it's used up here at the Torrance Refinery. Uh, I have weighed in, and we, we uh, ultimately came in in support of a staff recommendation uh, for the you know, refinery to take a, you know, a series of, of really strict mitigation efforts. And if it can't be shown that those mitiga mitigation efforts will dramatically minimize the risk of a catastrophic accident uh, that would really impact the health and lives of folks all over the South Bay, that they should phase out the MHF. Uh, so that's one example. Even though that, 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 uh, that refinery is not in my district, um, I've, I've been weighing in on this issue because it would certainly impact people in my district yes. uh, who live in the quote unquote kill zone, which is a frightening concept. Uh, you know, uh, so, so, so yes, all the time we are talking to, engaging with uh, constituencies and, and folks who've got uh, various opinions and issues. I think the Redondo Harbor one is a little, a little different just because um, you know, it, 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 that's within a city, but certainly my attitude has been to support the will of the voters there. Yeah. 
Thank you. Okay. Our time's up. <laughs> Baron. Um, this is, uh, again, there's a lot of layers of government and you all have to kind of work together, but um, taking things at the local level and understanding how it's going to impact the community and obviously working with different layers, uh, different departments that are going to they're going to see these solutions through, uh, hopefully. And um, when it comes to the, um, the you know, putting these um, toxic chemicals out there in these refineries, we have to obviously be aware of what the impact is gonna be, uh, both at the macro and uh, micro level. And um, so I'm, I'm definitely not for putting you know, additional poisons uh, in and around communities. Um, I also don't like that they're putting fluoride in, the, in our water supply as well, uh, which is a neurotoxin. So, um, you know, again, to, to, to Ben's point on Redondo, I think that's really more of an isolated local area, but when you start crossing different borders, that's when you have to have coalitions and working together. And someone like me, who's not affiliated with one party or the other, can come in unbiased and come in with a fresh voice and a fresh perspective and say, hey, look, I'm not backed by any of these unions that are gonna be developing these, uh, you know, putting these plants together or building these uh, shelters. You coming in and saying, okay, I'm a neutral party and I believe that we need to find the right approach, not the Democratic approach or not the Republican approach. Thank you. All right, Baron, we'll start with you on this question. What is your position on Prop 5? Yeah, so, um, so Prop 5 is the uh, property transfer tax initiative uh, that's gonna make it a lot easier for seniors and disabled folks to, uh, to move. Um, I'm in the real estate business, I run a real estate team, and I see this constantly, uh, especially with Prop 30 and 60 and 90 had gone down the road as well and been approved. This is something that's gonna really help people, and it's something that's made California unique in the fact that, we've, that we help our citizens, and with housing, affordi uh, housing affordability getting more and more out of reach for people, what we've seen happen is that seniors um, are reluctant to leave their homes, and oftentimes they're in a, in a home that they had with their families, and and the house is falling apart and there are a lot of considerable health and safety risks, but the senior person doesn't feel that they can get a new property because their property taxes are gonna increase dramatically upon getting a new home. But this, this uh, Prop 5 will allow them to transfer that tax basis so that they don't have uh, that financial burden to bear. And it's gonna be, again, I relate this back to health and safety issues. This is gonna help uh, protect uh, our senior citizens and people that are disabled or, or struggling uh, financially. But I encourage you to read that and I'm definitely for Prop 5, thank you. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm still uh, trying to figure out where I am on Prop 5, but I will say I just read the LA Times editorial on it and it raised a lot of very serious concerns about this proposition. Uh, it does offer some tax breaks, uh, but I think there are some, some big concerns about how it may uh, skew the housing market. Uh, it was put on the ballot by the realtors who, you know, good folks and Barron's one of them, but, but they are a special interest group too, right? And uh, very much so. And they have uh, their own set of prerogatives associated with uh, making sure that, you know, real estate commissions are strong and, and, uh, and that, 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 you know, uh, that, that, it's, that we do things to incentivize the, the constant churn of, of, of folks buying and selling homes. And so there are a couple things that were added into the proposition that raise serious concerns about uh, uh, the extent to which it's more about helping the folks who are put on the ballot rather than hope helping the rest of us or the homeowners. Uh, there's also some serious concerns about how much it may shortchange uh, schools and cities. And so I very much encourage you to take a look at that LA Times editorial. As they say, you know, I'm, I, I continue to be, I, I'm concerned as well about the costs uh, for especially older folks who are on fixed income. Uh, but I think there are some implications associated with Prop 5 that we really need to take a long, hard look at, and I, I, I don't think it's exactly what it appears. And the Times editorial does a great job of describing that. Thank you. All right, Ben, we'll start with you here. Homelessness has exploded over the past few years. Please tell us why and what can you do about it? So a huge problem, and I think it is also interrelated to a, a broader problem that I know that Baron and I both care about passionately, which is uh, housing affordability in general. Uh, we have more people on the streets now who than ever before who wouldn't have been on the streets uh, under normal conditions. There are certainly, we've always had a chronic homeless population, but you've got folks who are, you got more women on the streets, you've got more children on the streets, you got folks who were evicted and then they ended up in their car and then they ended up getting their car seized because of just the cost of, of living, the cost of housing. And so there's some huge challenges there. 
Uh, part of what we've been doing at the state level is providing more funding for homelessness. Uh, you know, we, there's 500 million of additional dollars that's going out to states and lo to, to localities and cities and communities to help. Uh, we've also been helping out with Cal Vets and, and through our veteran services. Uh, but, but ultimately, the biggest play in this area is at the county and the city level, with the city of Los Angeles and the county of LA stepping up and the voters uh, stepping up to tax themselves to provide funding for wraparound services and uh, and housing first for, for homeless folks, because it ends up costing a lot more, more money to have people in a supportive housing environment, sorry, less money to have them in a supportive housing environment than have them on the streets because of all the costs associated with mental health services and sanitation and cops and everything else. So the question now becomes, you know, we all together have to make sure that the county really spends this money well and delivers. And this is about holding our county af uh, accountable. And it's something that I'm seriously concerned about. I talk about this all the time. And I ask all the citizens in the room who care about this to get involved with local commissions, get involved with your city, push your county supervisor. This is a special opportunity that we, the voters, we, the taxpayers, have given to the county. And we Thank have you, to not squander it. Yeah. <laughs> Baron's turn. <laughs> I love the pa <laughs> No, I love the passion. And that's, uh, that's, that's why we, Ben and I think, get along so well. Because again, this, is not, this election is not about Baron Bruno versus Ben Allen. This is, uh, this is about a fundamental change that I want to see in uh, the state legislature with we're having more than two choices from two different parties that have let us down, uh, especially when it comes to homelessness. Uh, we have, if, if you ha aren't aware, over 135,000 homeless people in California. And that's about a, th a quarter of the nation, na nation's homeless. About a quarter of the people that are homeless are here in California. And uh, this goes back again to a lot of mismanagement of previous dollars. We've we passed a lot of initiatives to support the homeless. In fact, we have another initiative that's on the ballot again, another bond measure, which means a tax. Um, but um, when when we talk about homelessness, we need to look at who's going to solve the problem and come together. There are a lot of nonprofit organizations and people who really want to help, especially at the local level in their own communities. Um, I've seen uh, the negative effects of this with uh, Mayor Garcetti and Mike Bonin, uh, LA City Council member uh, in Venice Beach. I encourage you guys to look on, online to see what's going on in Venice Beach, where supposedly 45% of the uh, homeless in LA County are in Venice Beach. There were 30 sites selected, uh, 30, three, zero, and only one of those sites was in a residential neighborhood, and it happened to be in Venice Beach right by the beach. And they've chosen, they're looking at that hard, and they're probably going to choose that as the location. They're already having significant problems. Typhus, if you've read that, that's also a disease that's now from rats and uh, homeless. So we've got we've to take this on seriously and get the right people to make those type of decisions and not be influenced by special interests. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Time's up. Time's up. Okay. <laughs> I know you guys are really passionate. I'm always so hesitant to... Cut you off, but we have to move on. All right, we'll start with Barron. With California schools in the bottom 40% of U.S. schools, how can you improve the California school system? Um, thank you. Education is is massively important. It's probably one of the, the biggest things uh, that's facing California. You look at if you look at the dichotomy of California. Here we are, the fifth largest economy in the world. We have some of the smartest entrepreneurs, business owners, uh, and, and citizens that are, uh, are hard workers, but yet we have an abysmal rate when it comes to our education. We're spending, and Ben just acknowledges, that we're spending more per prisoner in California than we are per student. Way more. I mean, that, folks, that is unacceptable on both sides of the aisle. And this is why you need independent voice coming into government saying, okay, the right's wrong, the left's wrong, we need to move forward and get some solutions taken care of here. Um, so I know there's a lot of statistics on saying where we rank, and I've, I've looked at a lot of these. Some are you know, near the bottom, some are near at 49 out of 50. At the end of the day, this comes back to putting the students as our priority. And I know, I feel, I feel for the teachers who have to be surrogate parents. They also have to, in uh, many cases in California, be bilingual. Um, and there's a lot of uh, gender issues that are coming up with students now too. So a lot of burdens are being placed on these teachers, but the, I, I encourage the, the union, teachers unions, school boards, to really look at this from the student's perspective and how we can bring in some additional funding and also additional competition. Competition is healthy. Charter schools, private schools, and public-private partnerships will also ease the burden from the taxpayers. Thank you. Ben. 
Yeah, I, obviously an area that I've been thinking about working on for a long time. I served on the school board during the 2008 downturn and crisis, and so much of our time was just spent on, on trying to protect the basic programs that made our school district strong. Uh, during a very difficult time financially. And so I, I know and lived through that experience. And it's part of why I'm glad that the governor has been careful about trying to sock away some extra money in a rainy day fund so that you know when the inevitable downturn happens, we'll, have, we'll be able to cushion the impact on education. I mean, it's about 50% of our state budget goes into education. And, uh, and yet, you know, we, we have been really falling short. I mean, now that has to do with a lot of different things. There's a lot of liabilities on the books. Uh, and, and some of it does have to do with spe some special interest politics. Uh, but I think also uh, some of it has to do with, with our poverty. I mean, one, one of the problems that we have in California, we actually have the, low, we have the highest poverty rate in the country if you uh, correct for cost of living. And that, that puts a whole other uh, strain uh, on our resources because it costs more to properly educate kids coming from high poverty areas. And so I, for me, it's about supporting Al Muratsushi's uh, efforts that he talked about earlier in terms of raising the base grant. It's about making sure we give more flexibility to school districts and administrators to, to, to be able to manage their own uh, districts and, and, and run things efficiently. Uh, it's about looking at some of the long-term liabilities that are on the books uh, and, and, you know, uh, in our education system and having some really tough kind of come-to-Jesus conversations about how to, how to solve uh, some of the broader financial situation that exists at the, in okay, the edge. Okay, thank you. Next question, starting with Ben. What is your plan for prison reform? Yeah, great question. And, and you know, th th actually, it's a nice dovetail because, um, you know, th this <coughs> earlier, I, from my perspective, uh, you know, the question is, and how, how do we, re it's not how do we reduce expenditures in general, it's how do we reduce the, the, some expenditures, how do we end up spending less money on incarceration in prisons and more money on education? And you know, that's, that's at the, that should be at the heart of the conversation about prison reform. How do we create a prison system that is truly about protecting the public and not just uh, you know, truly about protecting the public? So, so do we want to fill up our prisons and spend all this money on folks who are there for, uh, for victimless drug crimes? Or do we want to have, uh, you know, or, or do we want to have systems in place for, uh, that, that really treat different kinds of crimes differently? Uh, where, where people who are truly dangerous are in the, in the prison system and that we have a better system for those who are not. The truth of the matter is our prison system is so terribly inefficient, something like 60% of those folks who go through the correction system end up re-offending and back into the system. So for me, it's all about having a better programs in place. You know, they've proven that arts programs, for example, in the prisons can plummet the recidivism rate. It's, it's amazing. It's hard to believe, but they've actually gone and they've shown that if you have an arts program or another sort of program that gives a prisoner a sense of self-worth and dignity, the chance that they will end up back in the system is so much lower than if you don't give them that kind of program. Uh, they're very cost-effective ways, and it partly involves us having a mind shift, a culture shift about how to, 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 to run our prison system and really focus on, on anti-recidivism. Yeah. Thank you. Bear. This is, a, I think, another one where um, uh, Ben and I uh, agree. And um, we have one of the highest incarceration rates uh, in the United States. Um, look it up, I mean, we have a lot of people that are behind bars. And to Ben's point, there are a lot of these people probably shouldn't be there. And, and bringing people back into the system, I think the, one of the biggest problems we have is once somebody goes into the system, uh, they almost never get out. And I think that's where we need to start focusing more on how do we get people that have been in the system, especially for nonviolent uh, offenses, how do we get them uh, out of the system and encourage them uh, through job, job training uh, opportunities, um, again, or pop potentially uh, more private partnerships where we can educate them and give them uh, that self-worth that they need because that's what happens is they feel that they've had the life taken out of them. Um, and most of these people have made one or two bad decisions in their lives, and that go, could go back to to um, not having a, a, a parent at home because mo both parents are working to pay the bills because taxes are too high and their commute's too long. So uh, a lot of people are in prison and incarcerated um, at, at quite honestly, a lot of oftentimes not fault of their own. So we need to look at how we can bring these people back into the mainstream. And you know, a lot of the, and I've even read something that they're you know, offering vegan meals in the prisons and things like that. So I read these things, I'm thinking, wow, what, this is a priority problem. 
we've got to prioritize people that are our are, are kids and keeping our, our streets safe and, and getting rid of the, uh, a lot of these excess problems. Thank you. All right, we'll start with Baron. What measures should be taken to ensure that all sections of our state have adequate water? Um, yeah, this is, uh, it goes, this is a sort of a multi-level uh, answer. Uh, we've, we've obviously witnessed, I think everybody in this room has witnessed, when we've had to scale back our water consumption, you know, no watering our lawns, no washing our cars. I commend uh, private businesses now for putting in, uh, uh, you know, uh, waterless urinals and also in the real estate business as properties are transferred, uh, lower usage uh, water faucets and toilets that were uh, enacted at the state level and some of the local um, communities as well. Um, conservation, education, uh, being responsible. And I think this also goes back to educating from the, from the ground level. When we start changing behavior with young people, it really has a, a, a significant impact whether it's uh, in, the, in the classroom or out of the classroom. But once we start training uh, our young people, hopefully in our schools, whether it's public or private, about conservation, about um, you know, not wasting our uh, utilities uh, and water, it will really go a long way. And I, again, also would like to see uh, our water supply uh, not being thrown you know, toxin after toxin after toxin. Um, it's, it's very, very dangerous. Again, look up fluoride, what they're putting in the water. It's a neurotoxin. It calcifies your pineal gland, and um, it, it, it dumbs it down. They've used it in World War II. This is not an answer. This is sort of a government quick fix. And um, we also need to look at uh, better agricultural practices, which we're seeing as well, which will reduce their amount of water usage. Thank you. Dan. Yeah, great question. Uh, something I think it, has come up a couple times through the course of the day. Uh, you know, I, I can't agree more about this issue of, of trying to make sure that we we don't uh, have toxins in the water. I actually ran a bill to make it so that uh, there'd be very severe restrictions on uh, the fracking process when they are re-injecting these hydrocarbon-filled amounts of water that they've taken up from the, underneath the ground, making sure that we had better protections in place before they re-inject that water into low salinity aquifers. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get that uh, across the finish line because of the power of the oil industry. But for me, that was an example of how we need to be thinking about the future and protecting our water supply. From my perspective, it's about having the infrastructure in place to make sure that we are doing everything we can to preserve and protect and, and prevent leaks, that we're, that we're con all, all, always uh, uh, you know, being efficient about the way we move our water around. Uh, I think within the agriculture industry, they need they, there's a lot of work that has to happen there on, on everything from the implementation of drip irrigation to changing the way we think about water rights one of the problems that we have right now is that there's too much of, a, of an incentive associated with using up all your water every year as opposed to uh, you know, using what you need because that could jeopardize your long-term water allocation rights down the line. Uh, we need to do more water recycling. Uh, that's something that we've been learning a lot about, and there's ways to, you know, that we don't need potable water to uh, to do lots of things that we don't, and you know, we don't need water, potable water to, to, to water your plants uh, or to be in your, you know, to be, to, to, for taking a shower. Uh, so there, there are much smarter ways that we can utilize our water. I will say we've shown the world that we can do better. Uh, you know, LA is now using the same amount of water that was in the 70s, even though we have much, many more people. Okay, thank you. So we'll start with you, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's like... <laughs> yeah, it's These are complicated issues. <laughs> I know, they are, yeah. Okay, where do you stand on open access to information on reproductive rights and to reproductive health services? Yeah, uh, I'm very supportive of, of reproductive rights and open access to information with regards to reproductive rights. I think in the end of the day, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's important for, for women and men to know more about their bodies and uh, the, you know, the implications associated with, with pregnancy and, 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 their, and reproductive issues in general. Uh, from my perspective, there has been a really inappropriate assault on reproductive rights at the federal level, and I'm just glad that California has continued to stand uh, for reproductive rights, and that's that's always been a priority for me. I, I, I support and work with Planned Parenthood. I, I you know work with folks on this, uh, uh, you know, and I'm I'm 100% with them. Okay, thank you. Um, I, it, this is something that again, uh, regardless of your religious beliefs and things like that, this comes down to I think health and safety issues. Again, I'm I'm pro-choice. I don't think that. Um, 
a bunch of old guys in Washington, D.C. should be telling a woman what to do with their body, for instance. Um, but at the end of the day, this, again, it comes down to education. And, and starting at, at the lower levels, we're starting to see a lot more teen pregnancies and things like that. Going back to our incarceration rates, a lot of these single dads have a lot of pressure on them because they've, uh, they've had several kids with possibly several women, and um, they're at their ends, end of the rope and doing things that are nefarious and illegal oftentimes. So uh, there needs to be... Um, more access, um, whether it's online. Um, I know we're putting a lot of burdens on our school counselors and things like that, nurses. Um, but having those people readily available and uh, even uh, implementing some hotlines, for instance, you know, a lot of uh, young uh, women and men, for that matter, don't really know where to go. They don't know really who to turn to. They're embarrassed oftentimes. They don't want to talk to their parents. So um, there needs to be something where they can call anonymously and get that type of information, and whether that's a public-private partnership or something that our government does, I think it would be extremely helpful because, again, people need to come out of the shadows and be proud of them, you know, wh who they are and what they've done, and if, they've, if they think they've made a mistake of some sort, then we can rectify the situation. But um, this is something that we as a nation and Californians need to come together at, and this is not a gender-specific issue. Um, but speaking of reproductive rights, I want to congratulate Ben and throw this in there with his uh, <laughs> uh, little baby boy who's in the room with us here. I'm not saying much, so. We, yeah. we are having a planned parenthood. And congratulations. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much. We're going to go to our closing statements down. We're going to start with Baron. Sure. You have two minutes. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here. It really means a lot uh, to us. And like I said, this is uh, uh, an election that's uh, not what we're seeing at the federal level and probably in a lot of the states and things you may be uh, hearing and seeing on our uh, local and national media, um, people who have differing opinions and some opinions that we agree on, we can get along and we can work together. And I hope that this is a model of future elections uh, for Ben, for myself, and other people that are here in this room that are watching, that um, it doesn't need to be divisive all the time. It doesn't need to be a winner take all, um, I won, you lost. And we need to get rid of that, um, that philosophy because that's not the way this country was founded. This country was founded on bringing people together. And uh, I s come from a point as a unifier, an independent person who, again, I don't want us shifting more to the left and I don't want us shifting more to the right. We need to come together and move forward. And that's what I bring to the table. Um, you can learn more about me again at votebaron.com. That's my website, and you can see how I'm going to best represent you. And I encourage you all not only just to reach out to me with questions, but reach out to uh, other elected officials like Ben and others when you do have these questions, and don't just use the forums like this, because that's what the public servants are, are here to do, is to represent you and not these special interests. But as your uh, next state senator, I'm going to make education and protecting our seniors and keeping our beaches and our clean and our community safe. Um, I believe in choice. I believe in respect. I believe in accountability. I believe in transparency. I believe that by electing me, Baron Bruno, you're going to put courage before fear, and you're going to put people before politics. As, the, uh, as Nelson Mandela, another independent thinker like me who fought hard to defy the system, even when people doubted him and discouraged him, he said, when you're making decisions, may your choices reflect your hopes and not your fears. And I hope you'll vote for me on November 6th. I'm Baron Bruno. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ben. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your, your, your attention, your interest in these really important issues. And once again, thank you to Barron for, for running. I, I, I got to say, I, I partly wish, um, I mean, obviously, I, I guess I wish I, you were running against someone else <laughs> for a lot of reasons, uh, partly because I, I actually think that, uh, that I, I don't disagree with, with what you say about, about the need for independent thinkers. And if you look at my track record in the legislature, I am a proud Democrat, but I think you'll also see me taking uh, an independent position over and over again on all sorts of issues uh, that, that where I've even broken with my party, where I've broken with special interest groups, uh, certainly in the area of, of transparency and campaign finance reform. Uh, that ran me up with some real tension against labor and, and with the business community and, and with some of the party leadership as well. Uh, so over and over and over again, I've tried to be the very kind of independent thinker that you've talked about, Baron, uh, someone who is, is, is true to the core values of my party, which are about protecting the environment, protecting seniors, 
seniors, you know, trying to have a better healthcare system for folks, have a better infrastructure for folks in, with regards to transportation and housing and services, uh, while also understanding that as a, if I really want to be able to look people in the eye and ask them to invest in, in all sorts of public programs and services, well, I have to be able to say to them, we're going to do everything we can to make sure that this money is being well spent, that we're going to be holding people accountable, that this is really all about the end user and not uh, uh, you know, it's about the ends rather than the means. And so from my perspective, my priority is about the, is the, is the kid sitting in, in class, it's, a, it's the person waiting in line at the DMV, it's the business person who's struggling to get a license with the Secretary of State's office, it's with the veteran who's calling our office to, to make sure that we're doing right by them and getting them the benefits that they need, uh, that they've been denied by the California National Guard for whatever crazy bureaucratic reason. That's what I work on every single day. Uh, big solutions, small solutions that help make life better for Californians writ large, but also for my constituents who are dealing with some level of frustration with the government. So I would be deeply honored to be returned to the legislature. My name is Ben Allen, and I humbly ask for your vote for my reelection. Thank you. Thank you. All right, this Thank concludes you. our candidates forum for the 26th State Senate District. Uh, I want to remind you that this has been taped and it will be on RPV channel 33. Um, I don't know when, so you'll just have to check the listings for that. Also, the candidates can have campaign material out in the lobby now after the campaign, so after the forum, so please go out and check and pick up literature and things like that. On behalf of the League of Women Voters of Palos Verdes Peninsula, and the PV branch of the American Association of University Women. I want to thank our candidates for coming today and being so gracious and, and, and so passionate with their answers. It's really nice. Um, also, thank you for the wonderful questions, whether you gave our, the questions before in the assembly uh, forum or now. They were really excellent questions, and we really appreciate it. Thank you. This forum is now concluded. Thank you. Thanks,